welcome back to the Aussie End Zone podcast. I'm joined by Manjot and Brad and a very special guest. Uh, he was a quarterback for Rutgers, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Vikings, the Lions. His name is Mike McMahon. Thank you very much for joining us. And how was your day? Uh, good, thanks. A little cold up here. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so, I mean, let's get stuck into it. You played for Wexford High School and Rutgers University. Uh, um, during that time at Wexford and or Rutgers, did you realize I'm I'm good at this? I've got a chance and want to like go go all out to make the NFL. Um. Yeah, you know, it, actually, I was better at baseball. And, oh wow! And um. And, you know, I, I, growing up, I, I, I can remember myself, you know, being in grade school and people asking questions like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I always said professional athlete, whether it be baseball or football. And, um, and I also played basketball, but, you know, I took a season off because of basketball because my ninth grade and I just kind of never went back to it. Baseball was my best sport, but, you know, uh, when I was in high school, um, the uh the baseball coach kind of you know left a bad taste in my mouth and i was like you know what i'm gonna go all in in football i'm gonna focus on football i'm gonna try and do whatever i can to put myself out there and try to earn a full scholarship and uh i was able to do it yeah wicked um and when you found out that you attained a scholarship to rutgers um what was there any other universities that offered you scholarships yeah, there was quite a few, um, but Rutgers came in, offered me, and I I thought about it, and um, I ended up giving a verbal commitment mm-hmm. early in my senior season. I just didn't really want to deal with m- more people calling. I wanted to focus on the season and just focus on school, and then at the end of the season, a lot more people started coming in, and the only one that really made me think about it was university of Miami. But, Mm -hmm. uh, but my dad was like, listen, you already gave your word to someone else. That's all you, that's all you got in this world. Once you give your word to someone, you stick with it. And so I did that. And, um, you know, it, I mean, it worked out, but I think uh, if I would have went to Miami, I might've been a a little healthier, (laughs) but, um, nowadays, you know, it's a business and, and just the way the, you know, the schools are, you know, trying to convince these kids to come and, and use these kids, to promote their program. You know, the kids got to look at what's what's best for them, too. So if that means saying yes to one school and then changing your mind later when your dream school comes along, then so be it. But um, how I was raised in, in, in the time period I was raised in, you know, my dad was like, listen, you gave yourself you gave him a verbal. And if you want to change your mind, you got to call them. But, you know, I think you should stick with your word. And I said, OK, yeah. No, that's fair enough. And it's like the honor system sort of thing, which is really good to see and really good to hear that it was instilled um, like in you and in other athletes as well around, at the time period. And you ended up being drafted in 2005. What was it like on draft night? Um, draft day. Um, no, yeah, well, sorry, yeah. It, it was, it was, it was, um, it, it, it's, it's, ups and downs and when i was drafted there was only two days the first uh, it was saturday the first uh three rounds sorry it was 2001 round five sorry my bad not 2005 round one my bad sorry no worries (laughs) no worries so it was the first three rounds and day one and then it was the uh, there was four rounds a second day yeah and so um i was projected to go in the on the first day either in the second or third round and there was a lot of talk that you know the cowboys were going to draft me and i was kind of excited i was really excited and then uh and then and then it's just like at the at the end they just like with no with no sign of anything they they ended up drafting quincy carter Mm -hmm. and and i think i remember i recall jerry jones saying you know him and quincy carter had the same birthday and that was kind of like the final deciding factor oh (laughs) gotta be kidding me and then um and then the other situation was it was supposed to be the Kansas City Chiefs in the third round. They were trying to acquire Trent Green, mm-hmm. and they were going to bring me in as a uh, like you know sit behind him and learn, mm-hmm. and and just kind of groom me behind him. And there, I re- I remember it was late, and they were not going to be able to get that deal done with Trent Green. So they ended up going out and signing Bubby Brister, mm-hmm. and. And then on the morning of the draft, 
they were able to get the deal done for Trent Green. So now they had Trent and Bubby <laughs> and they were like, well, you know, we're going to go in a different direction. So it, everything that could go wrong on draft wave went wrong for me, you know, oh, and, wow. and a lot of guys, you know, it's the greatest day for their life, you know, and still, obviously you look back and you did get drafted in the NFL and it's a great thing. But, you know, at the same time, when your name, you're just falling and falling in a draft, it can be, it can be, uh, get you very anxious as well. Yeah. So the draft day has never really been good to me because <laughs> even my second year, the, the Lions had told me I was their guy. I was going to be the starting quarterback. And, uh, and there was some talk that they were going to draft Joey Harrington and they were like, no, no, it's just a smoke screen. We're not going, we're going <laughs> defense. We need defense. And I remember the PR department came and asked me to do a, go to a draft party in Detroit for the lions. And, uh, and I said, listen, I will go, but just, I, just, are you guys drafting a quarterback? This would be really embarrassing. If you, and like, no, no. And even the coach like, no, we're not doing it. So I'm at the draft party, you know, promoting the Lions. And sure enough, that first, you know, it was like the third pick of the draft. Uh, it was David Carr first. I think Julius Peppers went second. And they ended up drafting Joey Harrington. And I was like, oh, gosh, draft day again got me. Wow. So back to back years, it, it uh, hit me hard. <laughs> That definitely wouldn't have been a fun time other than playing on the field. And what was it like um, from point of being drafted to the Detroit Lions, getting there, um, you know, and playing for a, a few seasons at Detroit after playing so many years in college football? Well, uh, I remember uh, when Detroit, there was two teams. When, it, when I started following late in the draft, I was like, you know, I really want to go to either Jacksonville or Detroit because yeah. those were the two teams that told me listen, we're interested in you and we really like you, but we're not going to take a quarterback till the sixth or seventh round. Yeah. You won't even be around. So, you know, it was great meeting you. And I was like, well, while I start dropping, I was like, well, these teams, you know, if, if they want me, you know, they can come get me And And Detroit uh, ended up trading their sixth and seventh round pick to move up in the, uh, to they traded him to the Patriots to move up and get me. And then I went to Detroit Yep, and it was a great, you know, I honestly, the, my first thought in my mind was I, all I could think of was Beverly Hills Cop. Like, do you know, this is what Detroit's going to be like. But yeah. Detroit is a really nice area. I mean, obviously downtown the at the time wasn't the best area. I think they've built it up now. But, uh, you know, the, at the time, the team was out at, in Pontiac at the Pontiac Silverdome. Yep. The Pistons were out in Auburn Hills. A lot of the players lived in the Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills area, and it was a really, really nice community and very nice area. You didn't have to go into the city because the, all the the areas had like little towns where if you wanted to go to a nice restaurant or grab a drink somewhere, they had, you know, restaurants and bars in, in each area. And they also had some great golf courses and, and a small slopes if you wanted to go snowboarding or skiing mm -hmm. nearby. So there was so much to do, a lot of lakes and um, – and it worked out too for me because, you know, one of my good friends uh, from high school, a guy that I actually backed up my junior year, he was a senior, he was a starting quarterback. He ended up getting a job in Michigan right before I went there. And oh, wow. so it was great to have a familiar face uh, there as well for me. Oh, for sure. Um, I'll just go for a few more questions and then I'll pass it off to Brad and Mandrot. Um, so after your time with Detroit, you headed over to Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, so a new state, new town, um, new culture, for lack of a better term. Uh, what was it like? And also, did you get a Philly cheesesteak when you were there? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, so first, you know, in, in Detroit, I lived in the suburbs. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our facility was located out in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And and I grew up in Pittsburgh in the suburbs as well. So that was something that was very useful. And when I went to Philly, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll try city living for once. Yeah. And uh, that was a big mistake. <laughs> I didn't realize coming home after practice, you know, you had to like go in, park your car, and then either walk or take a cab. Otherwise, you weren't going to find parking in the city. And um, it was just a different thing. Um in Detroit, you know, you go out, you know, people are like, hey, hey, it's pretty cool. You play for the Lions. Oh, sweet. You don't play for the Red Wings. Sorry. <laughs> you know, there was more of hockey town. <laughs> yeah. And in Philly, once you get to Philly, I mean, it was, you know, fans were diehard Eagles. And they, you know, they would love you when you're out. But if you did 
anything <laughs> wrong, like on the field, you were getting booed. So, I mean, it was definitely diehard. Um, unfortunately, uh, when I was there, it was during the year when Terrell Owens and Donovan had a little bit of a tiff. And, mm-hmm. uh, and when you're friends and teammates with both of them, you try to like, you know, just not talk about any of that and not bring it up. And you just gotta, you know, you try to be the best teammate and best friend you can be, you know, yeah. but it, it's hard because one guy looks at you and he's like, Oh, you're, you're, you know, so it's, it's tough, but um, it, it's a shame because both of those guys were great athletes. And when they were on the same page and when they were gelling, it was like a thing of beauty to watch them work as an offense. But you know, when it started the egos and it wasn't just one sided, it was both sides. And yeah. quite honestly, and, and it's just unfortunate. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and then after the Eagles, you also had some time at the Vikings, the Packers, <clears throat> pardon me, the Packers uh, rivals. What was it like again, uh, going to a new, new state, <clears throat> new town, um, you know, sort of thing. Did you do city living, as you said, or did you do uh, suburb living? What was it like? So uh, they were out in Minnesota. Uh, they were in um, uh, Eden Prairie in, in Minnesota at the time. Now they have a new facility there, but they were in the suburbs and I found a place, a really nice, like a little townhome apartment in the suburbs, uh, probably, you know, not even five minutes of a drive uh, away. <laughs> So it was very easy, and I, I was really excited. And the GM that had brought me in, um, there was two teams that were really interested. It was the Vikings and the Broncos. And yep. I was originally supposed to go fly to Denver. And my agent had changed it and said, no, you're going to go to Minnesota first, then to Denver. And uh, the GM that really – the GM tried to get me the year before. He really liked me. The head coach, just Brad Childress, he just got the head coaching job. He was in Philly the year before. He said it was a no-brainer. And then I think it was about a month or two, you know, they talked me into not even flying to Denver. And uh, wow. it's, it's something I really regret because Denver was one yeah. of my favorite places to ever play. And, you know, as a quarterback, yeah. you go out in the Denver and you're throwing that football in that thin air, man, it could really move. <laughs> but – um. Yeah. But, you know, also they had Mike Shanahan at the time and, and I really regret, you know, just going in and learning his offense. But, you know, Brad uh, was like, Hey, you know, you know, me, you know, the offense, you're going to get a chance to start. Uh, we got Brad Johnson as our starter. You know, you, you're going to get a chance to really go in there and compete. And, and then about a month after I'd signed the GM that they had, they ended up firing because there was an air on his resume. They brought in a new guy. And as soon as they brought in, uh, it was uh, Spielman, um, I believe. And mm-hmm. as soon as they brought him in, uh, my agent was like, you are in a bad spot because he does not like you at all. And then so they kept me around all through training camp. And um, and then the very last cuts, they released me. And it's kind of hard because at that point, it's it's tough to latch on somewhere because basically, especially a quarterback, yeah. Um, unless that team runs the same system, it's kind of hard to switch. Now I went and worked out for Cleveland, and mm-hmm. and Cleveland was like, wait, wait, and I had a phenomenal workout with them too, and they were like, wait, why did they cut you? I'm like, I don't know, and uh, and they said, well, you're on our short list. You know, we got our guys in place, but if something happens if an injury happens. You know, you're our first guy. And I was like, okay, but there was no injuries and. So, you know, I learned the business side of it, you know, and uh, it's tough, you know, because one moment everyone's telling you, oh, you're going to have a great career. You're going to have you're going to play for 15 or 20 years. You can you can be a backup and hold the clipboard forever. And next moment you're out. So Mm. it was it was very tough learning process. But, um, you know, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, It's just it is what it is. Yeah, that's fair. And I'll pass it off to Brad to ask you a few questions. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mike, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hey, um, no worries. It's great. It's great talking with you. So uh, I'm just curious because you mentioned, you know, your buddy started over uh, in high school uh, when yes. you were a junior. So did, was that just a case of, of he was a stud athlete? Cause usually guys that go on and be college starters have been playing for a while in high school, you know, whether sophomore, junior, senior year, but you didn't start till your senior year. Was that just because he like he was a stud or did you just develop as a player? Well, I, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. I was a skinny kid. Um, yeah, I, I always had decent speed. I had a really strong arm. But the school I went to was um, it was a very big school. And 
Yeah. Uh, we actually had a separate building for ninth and 10th grade, about five miles away from the senior. We, oh, wow. we called it an intermediate high school and then the senior high school. And the 11th and 12th grade building was in a different campus. And, um, and so it's, it, I think there was like what, 620 crit kids in my graduating class. Um, but, um, it's a big school and a lot of good athletes and how it's kind of the program is run is, you know, you've been in the system and when it's your turn, you're going to get that first opportunity. And as long as you don't screw it up, they're going to continue playing you. And actually the guy that started in front of me, we had met uh, the first time when he was, he was in the seventh grade. I was in sixth grade. We met at a basketball camp. We had to play one-on-one against each other. And he ended up beating me. Yeah, he's a he's a great basketball player, and uh, and he was a good baseball player, good football player too, really good quarterback. And he ended up going on to Holy Cross and playing defensive mm. back. And I told him, play quarterback, play quarterback. I, I've been around, I've been at the D one, I've seen some guys play at the D one level, and he was by far better than a lot of the other guys. And and he had a very smart, uh, very nice ball he threw, very accurate. And for whatever reason, he just never got the looks. Now, when I went to become my senior year, um, I started attending a few camps, and there was another guy that was heavily recruited in that area. And so when I went to this one scouting camp type thing, one of the the guys, uh, one of the scouts had come up and said, hey, you you guys mix these kids up. The numbers are wrong. And he goes, no, that's right. You know, that that kid's – the North Allegheny quarterback over there. Uh, and he's like, are you, he hasn't played yet. And they, and they were like, no. So that's how schools, you know, they were coming to look at another guy, uh, another yeah. quarterback from a different area. And then, yeah. you know, they thought the numbers were mixed up and uh, that's how I kind of popped on people's radars. And then I went to the Rutgers quarterback camp. And then once that happened, uh, they were like, listen, we want to see one game film. And, and if it's good, we're going to offer you. And they did. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you just, so you immediately popped up on people's radars because of the camps and what have you. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to the camps. So we got, go ahead, go ahead. So I went to the camps and, and I was, I I truly was determined. I remember, I remember doing a a school project in 11th grade and we had to talk about what we were going to do and stuff. And I said, I I was like, at that point I was all in on football. Uh, My last year of baseball was my sophomore year. So I was all in on football, and I remember saying, I was like, listen, I'm going to play in the NFL. This is what I'm going to get, Division One scholarship. And I remember specifically one of my female classmates laughing at me and telling me, she's like, you never even started. You're not going to do this. And I was like, watch me. And um, so mm-hmm. going the, that mm-hmm. summer, going into my senior year, we would have uh, morning workouts. And, you know, you do like lifting and you do running, and then sometimes – you know, two or three days a week, you would do some throwing, just throw on air with the receivers, get routes in. And then that's like at six in the morning till about nine. And then we would have like uh, the seniors would always go to have like a, a team breakfast somewhere. And then you kind of go home and nap and then get up and do whatever you want in the afternoon in the summertime. And a lot of guys, you know, they'd go to the pool or whatever. And, and I can remember every single day I would call guys and be like, Hey, you want to go back up and throw? And no one ever would do it. And, doing uh, the extras. Yeah. and one time, one time a guy came up and it was a hot day and he's like, he was there for five minutes. He's like, you know what? I'm going to the pool. So I would go up there and I would actually mm-hmm. have, I had a bag of footballs about 15 or 20 footballs and I would set up garbage cans. And so like I would throw like fade routes, I would throw go routes, but then like anytime I wanted to throw a slant or an out, I'd set the garbage can up where I would think the receiver would be. And then I would put a bunch of broomsticks in it standing up. So I'd have to hit it and then fall down. And I used to just go up there and I would throw every day and, and by myself and uh, just awesome. worked on my game. And I was just determined that I was going to get it done. Sorry to interrupt, but that's, that's awesome. definitely the difference between someone that makes the NFL and someone that doesn't the extras that you did after practice when you weren't required to do it. That's definitely, you know, a really good ethics instilled in you. Sorry, continue, Brad. Yeah, I, just, I appreciate you sharing that story because because we got guys here, young guys who who play football, who listen to the podcast, and they would love to be able to go over to the States and have that college experience. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so... It, Talk to us a little bit about that. What was that college? Because you were a four-year starter in college. Yeah, so it, 
so when I went there, um, the offense we ran in high school was it was like the Delaware wing T. Was a lot of handoffs, a lot of faking. We ran some midline option, some veer option, triple option that Army and Navy runs. And yeah. and when I came up, you know, my high school coach said, "Listen, you have you've had the strongest arm that has ever come through this school. You know, I'd really like to put in some drop back passing for you." So the drop back passing we had in, it, there wasn't many reads. It was like, you know, drop back, you're going to read one outside linebacker and, and you're going to kind of go off that. So it wasn't very difficult uh, of an mm. offense. For, and so when I went to Rutgers, you know, now I'm going and this, the playbook was about four or five inches thick. It's the West coast mm. offense. Terry Shea brought in from, you know, what Bill Walsh done. And there was a lot of terminology, a lot of verbiage, and it was tough for me, mm. but, um, but as, you know, as the season went on, we played our first game. I believe uh, the first game was against Virginia Tech, and we got beat pretty bad. And then we went down to Austin, Texas, and, you know, there was 110,000 people there. And this was Ricky Williams' junior year and the year he ended up winning the Heisman. And, I mean, it was just an incredible atmosphere. Um and then we came back. The third game was against Boston College. We were getting beat. And and now the rules have changed in Division One football, where you can play so many steps and and still redshirt. Um, now, yeah. when I was there, you could play the first three games, but after that, if you played, you couldn't redshirt. Um, okay. And you could play the first three games and get a medical redshirt. Well, I ended up coming in and. Uh, it was, you know, late in the game against Boston College, and it was uh, – the first play we ran was 24 Cowboy. I still remember it. And my roommate, Delrico Fletcher, who I ended up losing to in the Western Pennsylvania High School Championship <laughs> to him, I he told me about it all four years too, you know, how he beat me. He was my receiver. He ran a corner route, and – I was supposed to do a seven-step drop, and I think I was so hyped up. I ended up doing an 11-step drop hitched up and just gunned the ball into him. And, and right then and there, it was kind of like off and running. Like it was just a, it kind of sparked our offense. We didn't have, um, we had a good recruiting class, which a lot of young talent, the older guys that were at Rutgers though, uh, you know, we were just, you know, we were outgunned. And um, so this young class, it, you know, it was almost like, uh, well, let's get these guys on the field and, and they give us a chance to win. So, and, and that's what happened. And I just, you know, went with it. Uh, that's cool. So do you still have uh, solid relationships with those guys from college? Cause you know, typically college is so much more like bonding type atmosphere versus the NFL where it's a business. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, I keep in contact with a few guys here and there. Um, yeah. Uh, I, the NFL is definitely a business, uh, but yeah. at the same time, you do have like your little groups that you kind of hang out with, especially as young guys. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you do have some, but it, it's funny though, because when I was in college, uh, I was so focused, you know, my, <laughs> I wasn't the best student and I kind of did whatever <laughs> I could to just stay eligible to play ball. And, um, sure. and I was so focused I mean, I would, our study hall uh, was in the same building as the football. So I would sneak out of the study hall room, walk in and start watching film. And I was so focused on football. You know, I, kids go to college, you know, they, you know, you go out, you drink, have a good time. I, I drank uh, no more than twice a year and I didn't even drink wow. on my 21st birthday. So wow. I was completely committed to playing and somehow finding a way to make it to the NFL. That it just it was in my mind, and I was gonna do whatever it takes. Yeah, yeah. I need I need to give Manjo a chance here, but before I, before I do that, I gotta ask you. So so your jump. So obviously college is ending. You're going to the pros. Did you? What was your combine experience like for you personally? Was it enjoyable? Was it stressful? Uh, a little bit of both. So actually, the first thing that happened was I got invited to the Blue Gray All Star Game, um, which you know. It was uh, basically for any senior that their college had not made a bowl game. And so mm -hmm. there were some really good players there, actually, you know, but 
I remember we had four receivers, one from Colorado, one from Washington State. Uh, Kevin Casper from Iowa, he ended up going to Denver for a little bit. And then uh, another guy. And this other guy, you know, I remember throwing him in practice. And I was like, man, this guy cannot catch. He cannot catch a cold. I'm like, I don't know. And sure enough, you know, the coach, Ron Turner at the time, he was the coach, uh, I believe, at Illinois. He he came in, and we were running the same West Coast offense that I'd run all four years. So I was like, oh, this is easy. It was my, my myself and another quarterback, I believe, from, like, Idaho or Idaho State. And we were going to play every other series, but I earned the get to start. So the first series, I come out there, and one of my starting receivers, my Z receiver, is this guy that can't catch. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't know about this. And we go first down out, second down out. Now it's third and 12. And uh, I'm like, man. And I and the play, he's the number one receiver I got to throw to. And it's just 22 Z in. The linebacker jumped in on the, uh, on the uh, tight end. And so I'm like, all right, here it goes. I have to fit this one in a tight window between the safety and the corner. And I, uh, the Z goes up and runs a curl. And I, I let this ball rip. And when I threw it, I threw like my fastball, like my Brett Favre wind up and throw. Yeah. And it was a little high. It was a touch high. So most receivers, when they come out of that curl route, and it's a little high. They'll, they're going to jump up and use their body to protect that. He came out of his break and with naughty, he came back to the ball. And he just put his hands up in the air, plucked it. And I'm like, how did this, where did this kid's hands come from? He couldn't catch the ball a week. He, <laughs> cl- he plucks it out of the air, turns around, puts a move on the corner in the safety, and then goes like 80 yards for a touchdown. And I'm like, oh, wow. I am throwing the ball to him every play. And do you know who that receiver was? <laughs> hey. Oh. Steve Smith from the Carolina Panthers. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, man, this guy's awesome. And I ended up throwing uh, three touchdowns in that game, two of them to him. Uh, oh, there was, they, they have an offensive player and a defensive player, and then they have an MVP. And Steve got the offensive player, and I got the MVP because of that game. So uh, I thank That's you, awesome. Steve Smith, for helping me get the MVP. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> And after that performance, I ended up getting a, an invite to the Senior Bowl. And then from the Senior Bowl, I got an invite to the Combine. And in the Combine, it was a, it was a very interesting experience. Um, it, it's, it's like a meat market, you know. And, yeah. and, I, and I think I've heard some guys come out recently and, and say, you know, it, it's like you're, you're like a slave. And I understand what they're saying, but – it, listen, it's it it's it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your race, everyone has to go through it. And at the end of the day, someone's gonna invest a bunch of money into you. They want to see what they're getting. And hey, exactly. it is what it is. So, you know, I heard about it. You, you know, you're basically wearing these little shorts, you're in a room, there's every team, every coach on that team, every scout in that organization. The GMs are all in there. The training staff are all in there. And you're basically standing in, the, in these little shorts that are like underwear. You go up, you, you know, you, they measure your height, weight, your. I'd like uh, it. I'd liken it more to cattle, you know, to be like. Exactly. You know, they're trying it to is. get the best stock sort of thing. It's And that's it, it, and that's exactly what it felt like, you know, oh, and wow. I understand. It would be a bit dehumanizing, what, wouldn't it? No, it wasn't. Right? It really wasn't because okay. you, you had. This was this was an opportunity. I, I remember the big talk because I came out the same year as Drew Brees and Michael Vick. And, and the big oh, wow. talk was, are they going to break the six foot mark? And so, <laughs> you know, are they going to be tall enough? Uh, and but you, you worked out, you know, you, obviously I played in the senior bowl. And then after the senior bowl, it was, you know, you know, the rest of January and February. I had, you know, a month and a half to to get ready to get my best shape mm-hmm. to to mm. and and you trained for this so you were kind of like excited and yeah. hey i wasn't embarrassed I, yeah I, I was like listen i'm in great shape right now i'll take my shirt off and stand in my underwear in front of these guys it doesn't bother <laughs> yep. me measure yeah. your pinky to your thumb then i i will say the hardest thing though was when you go in and you go through these physicals and you have to go through a uh an nfl combine physical but then mm. Mm. Every team, you have to go meet with their trainers, and they have your medical file there, and they're going to check every injury you ever had. And I had shoulder surgery, and they're going to crank on it to see how healthy it is and all this stuff. 
And I got through all of the teams and I was feeling pretty good. And the very last team, the one doctor had me do uh, a strength test on, and it was the, it, the only team that had me do it this certain way. And when he did mm. it, I was like, Oh my goodness. It just hurt my shoulder. And my shoulder was sore for like the next week. And, but I had to throw <laughs> wow. the next day. So uh, yeah, it, it is, they're going to crank on your injuries. And that, and that was definitely a, uh, a downside of that. <laughs> That's but other than that, it's a good learning experience. You go out, you meet with the coaches, you do a little bit of the, the interviews and uh, mm. a lot of, a lot of tests, a lot of personality tests too. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Thanks, man. It was, it was a, it was a good learning process. I thought good experience. Yeah. Nice. Uh, we'll cross it over to Manjot uh, to ask some questions that he may have for you. Take it away, Manjot. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thanks Mike for hopping on to the Aussie end zone podcast. Uh, massive. Thank you for your time no worries. today. And uh, just asking, there's a lot of talk about quarterbacks coming out of college or every single year and like their adjustment to the NFL. How is like your adjustment to like the NFL style of like offense? Like how is it like, you know, team structure, just the entire lot. It, the game is, is the game is faster. And, and I will say from what I played till today's mod, to the, today's game, things have changed so much that mm. Uh, um, it was, I, I think it was more beneficial for when you to come out at that time to sit and watch a little bit. And you kind of like a, a perfect example was look at, look at how Aaron Rodgers he got to sit behind Brett Favre for a little while and, and get groomed. And then boom, he takes off and he's had a phenomenal career ever since. Um, hmm. Very few guys can come in and start, you know, and, and just be successful. You know, you look at Peyton Manning, he had his ups and downs in his rookie season. Uh, and then you see, you know, what Justin Herbert did, uh, not this past year, but the year before. I mean, he had a phenomenal rookie season. Hmm. And so when you come in, the playbooks were just bigger. But the and also the, what the game was different. I played in the era of you know, the, the segment on Monday night, he got jacked up, you know, and yeah. you got hit. And, and now it's, it's not about getting big hits and getting jacked up in the hard hit videos. It's now it's about protecting the player's safety and health. So now it's all about fantasy football, getting points. So the mm -hmm. stats, you know, people are like, Oh, how come the quarterback stats are better? Oh, they're throwing the ball. Well, no, you know, a lot goes into it. One, you can't hit the quarterback below the knees and you can't hit him in the head when i played you could hit him wherever you want and you hit him as hard as you could yeah uh two you can't hit a defenseless receiver so i re i remember very vividly you know in practice one time throwing a ball down the middle of the field on four on uh two jet all go which was four verticals and looking the safety off and he caught it about 25 yards and my coach got in my rear end and said listen that ball cannot be caught deeper than 22 yards. It's between 18 and 22 yards. Anything deeper than that, it's a medicine ball. And what a medicine ball is, is you're going to throw it, you're going to get your receiver's head taken off, and they're going to have to bring the ambulance out to pick him up. And what happens is when you throw that mm -hmm. ball late down the middle, they hit him so hard, a lot of times that ball flies up in the air, it's picked off and returned. And, yep. and so it, it's just tougher. Now the defense can't tee off on those guys. So now teams actually tell their quarterback third and how many times do you see teams third and long converting a lot more yeah. than they used to. Yeah. And so now they're taught, Hey, go ahead and take that chance down the middle. If they give us the big hit and they intercept it, well, they're going to get the penalty and we're going to get a free first down and it doesn't go against your stats. Mm -hmm. So the stats for quarterbacks nowadays are much better basically because of the rules, I believe. Um, the quarterback's protected, the receivers are protected. It's much more difficult for the defense. And I think with the player association rules, there's, there's certain, you can't practice as much as you used to. Now we had, we had two days when I was there, I actually think there was even three days with some special teams sometimes, but now there's only one practice a day in training camp. It's just different. And it's a lot more meetings. So, and 
also now you're allowed to do these RPOs, you know, and so it's just a different game, um, which makes it easier for quarterbacks to get out on that field quicker because they are protected. They, they can do certain things. The defenses aren't as stout. Like, you know, going against the Ravens and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, you know, and there's no protection there. You know, they're, they're teeing off on your uh, receivers and, and, and on the quarterbacks. Well, now with that protection, it, it allows you to do more things offensively and take more opportunities. And you saw it progress over time through the, you know, the, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013, and the rules kept on changing. You see these guys complaining about how am I supposed to pull off on this hit, you know, and now the, the guys do it. And now they just play the football. If they can get to the ball. Great. If they can't, they got to let the guy catch it and, and try to make the tackle. Yeah. And the game's completely changed. I, I, but I enjoy watching it more now. And I just wish I was born 20 years later. <laughs> 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 yeah fair enough um did you so just talking about a few of the franchises and leagues you went to so in Detroit did you feel any pressure to like you know be the franchise like savior like sort of thing like did you feel any sort of pressure to like help them win like uh, no I mean I remember I remember getting drafted and I remember going through the mini camp process and being like wow this playbook is a lot and I remember for whatever reason, the coaches, you know, the, the style of coaching they did on me, it was almost like a, a, a break this guy down and then we'll try to build him back up. And I remember questioning myself, like, I don't even know if I can, I don't know if I'm going to make the roster. And I, and then it got to the point where they were just constantly yelling at me so much. I wasn't sure if I was doing something right or wrong. I was so unsure. And I remember telling my dad, I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. This is, I mean, I, I just feel like I'm not doing anything right. And, and I, I, I'm not having fun. And then the first preseason game, uh, I remember coming out uh, of the tunnel and playing and then having like these live bullets come at you in the rush and the, and the guys chasing after you because in practice, the quarterback doesn't get hit. And so it, it was, I remember we had an old uh, O-line coach, Carl Mock, and, and I would drop back. And as soon as I hit my last step, you would hear him say, throw the ball, throw the ball. And I'm sitting there going, why is the old line coach down? And it was like never getting it out on time. And I was like, man, geez, you know, give me a break here. And once the preseason started and guys were allowed to tackle me, you know, I was, I was very mobile, especially coming out of Rutgers. And, you know, I had to learn how to get mobile fast. I went into Rutgers running a four, seven. And uh, when I came out, I ran a four five and, uh, <sighs> And I actually, I actually, I ran a four, five, one electronic. I actually ran a four, four, eight handheld. And the Browns asked me if I would play receiver. And I was like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, but I was a very mobile guy. So during that preseason and those guys were coming at me, I was able to move around, make some plays. And then I think the guys on the team started seeing that and they're like, Oh man, this kid can play. And, and it kind of helped building my confidence back up. Uh, the the mini camps and training camp though man it was a grind and it was a grind for me and it, it made me question myself quite a bit but then I started to love it and and I was like all right I can do this it was just I just need that opportunity and uh, and I didn't get the opportunity that I really wanted but you know hey it's it's a business and you know when they draft a guy third pick overall he's gonna end up playing a lot sooner than you uh, want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I gotta ask you uh, if I can if I can interject, Manja, because um, I'm from Oregon, and yep. so uh, you know I, I grew up going to see Joey play, yeah, um, type thing. So wh what what was he like as a teammate? Uh, was he a good dude, or was he was he, is there helpful in that quarterback room? Did you guys help each other, or or was there a lot of every man for himself? Well, it, I, so it it was a little different, I will say. Um, when mm -hmm. I was um, in my mini camp, I had there was uh, Charlie Batch, there was Corey Sauter. They brought in Jim Harbaugh, and it was myself. And that was in mm -hmm. mini camp and training camps. And uh, Corey was going to be basically the odd man out. Um, Charlie was a starter. Jim was kind of like the veteran backup, and they were going to kind of groom me. And Jim was doing a great job. I, you know, I, he helped me out. He reached out to me even on the night off. He's like, 
come on, Mikey, let's go grab some food together. And really great guy. Mm. And uh, I, he was helping me out a lot. And, but he wasn't mm. in that West Coast offense. He always run like the, the numerical system. So on the very mm-hmm. last cut, they ended up cutting him. And, mm. and it was a shock. I was like, oh, wait, they cut Harbaugh? Like, what? And he ended up going on and, uh, I think he was a quality control guy for the Raiders for the rest of that season. And I'll tell you what, it worked out great for him because look where he's at now. But uh, they ended yeah. up trading yeah. for Ty Detmer. And Ty had played in Green Bay and played in San Francisco in that system under uh, Marty Morningwig. And Ty came in, and Ty mm-hmm. was immediately uh, like a great dude, good help. Um, married guy, four kids, really good guy. He and I used to carpool uh, to work. And he really kind of took me underneath his wing. And I actually learned more from Ty Detmer than I did from any of my quarterback coaches in the NFL. And Mm. uh, Ty was Mm. just a great guy. And Charlie was a starter. And and I don't know what it was. I I felt like I wasn't trying to step on anyone's toes. But I felt like Charlie kind of looked at me a little bit as like, hey, he's the competition. And, you know, this was new to me. This was a, a new thing. Yeah. And, and I didn't understand the business side of it yet. And Charlie knew it. Hey, there's always a young guy going to come in and try and take your position. So Charlie and I didn't have the best relationship, but Ty was always really cool with me. And then when Joey came in, Joey, you know, I tried to be nice to him, you know, cause you know, obviously we were competing and I knew what was going to happen, but there was a few things that <laughs> at the time had rubbed me the wrong way. Um, I remember we were playing a preseason game against the Ravens in Baltimore. My sister was living in Maryland at the time. My mom and my sister, uh, my mom came in town and we were all going to dinner. So I invited Ty and I invited Joey to come to dinner with us. And we were all there. And my mom's like, Oh, so Joey, you're from Oregon. And he, and he's like, no. And my mom's like, what? She's like, I thought you went to Oregon. He goes, no. She goes, didn't you go to the University of Oregon? He goes, no, I went to the University of Oregon, not Oregon. Oh, and, okay. and he was dead serious. And Ty was like, are you serious? Like right now? And Joey's like, it's pronounced Oregon. And, and that I remember that day like it was That's yesterday. A, and I was like, yeah. and I was like, okay, all right. It was, and he was a nice guy. And, mm. you know, but he was just. It was just a little different. And, and I think, I think, I don't know if anyone's, I, I talked to a guy who, who has talked to Joey, um, uh, I would say maybe like a year ago. And I think he, he had told me that his experience when he was a kid was not a good experience with Joey. And he said, he went up and told Joey, he's like, listen, I, I really didn't like you as a quarterback. You, you kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. And, but he said that Joey had told him, listen, I apologize. I was told a lot of things and you are, you, you, you got agents telling you one thing, you got other guys telling you other things. And sometimes the advice you're receiving is not the best advice. And for whatever reason, um, he just, you know, like he, he kind of rubbed people the wrong way sometimes. And I don't think he meant to, I think it just came off as a, as a, as a bad thing. And he was actually, you know, it, it was, it was just a tough situation. Um, but you know, we butted heads, you know, there was some competition, but, um, but, you know, as a young quarterback and just looking at how things were, um, you know, coming in off the Heisman trophy, you know, campaign and all that stuff, like, yeah, you know, you're going to have that little bit of an ego and, um, and it just, it just didn't like sit well at certain ways. And, and for whatever reason, it just, um, it, it's the way it was, but I think, I think he's reflected back and I look back and I wasn't, I wasn't perfect at all. I made some major mistakes here and there, but, um, you know, as you grow older and you reflect back, you, you learn from those mistakes and I'm sure he has as well. Um, but yeah, I, one thing I always did was I never turned down anyone for an autograph. I always would take the time yeah. and, you know, there was there was guys that would show up and ask you to sign things and you knew they were selling it yeah but i was like really like i, I don't care. Nah. like go ahead like you know what you want to go sell it <laughs> i don't care like go ahead sell it. like I, and you know so that's what happened like joey would oftentimes be like well who who am i signing this for i just signed one for you and and i think that kind of rubbed people the wrong way at times mm. 
But other than that, like, mm. you know, he was, you know, we, we had some decent moments. We had some good competitive moments and we got along at times, but at other times we just, you know, didn't see eye to eye. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean, it is so, what it is. Ty yeah. was a good so buffer. If- Ty, Ty, Ty was a good buffer there, and <laughs> he kept things loose in, in the in the in the meeting room. But um, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, it's you're you're gonna you're, you're not gonna be best friends with everyone. Yeah. So no, that's yeah. fair. We'll cross it back over to Manjot to finish off some questions, and then after that, um, we'll we'll go some fun ones to finish off the interview. Go ahead, Manjot. Yeah. So with Philly again. Like obviously the fan base very passionate. Mm-hmm. Was it even more? Was it even more pressure because of how much success they had? Because the time you came in, they literally just like came off a Super Bowl appearance. They're like in the NFC Championship game like four years in a row. Like, was there any like extra extra pressure from like the Philly? Yeah, you fan base. Yeah, you felt it, and and at the same time, I I don't think it was so much from the fan base for me. I think it was more. Like, okay, they just came off the Super Bowl. I just came from the Detroit Lions. And Mm. if something happens, you know, like I need to go in and I need to perform well. Because if not, they're going to be like, okay, well, you know, he's not good enough. And so I think that was a lot of it in my mind. But, you know, Todd Pinkston ended up uh, tearing his Achilles. He was kind of like the vertical burner Mm. guy. Uh, obviously, you know, T.O. kind of held out for a little bit. And then when he came in, I mean, he was phenomenal. But but then, like, right when Donovan got hurt, T.O. got suspended. And, you know, and now I'm in there playing. And my number one receiver was our our rookie, Reggie Brown, who was a great, great receiver. Uh, mm-hmm. Our entire O-line, Trey Thomas, uh, Runyon, all those guys, our entire O-line was injured. Westbrook had the Liz Frank injury. And now – you know, I'm coming in. We had Ryan Motes, a really good running back. We just had a young team, and uh, and I knew it was going to come down on me. But uh, you know, it is what it is. I was like, but listen, can we get To back? Because I don't have any issues with it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I don't. He, you know, I don't care. He, I, I'll just throw him the ball. <laughs> I will say, yep. he is by far the hardest working individual i have ever met on a field on Mm. a practice field we used to come out in training camp Mm. and you know like when you go out in the field on a summer morning you got the dew on the grass so it's wet and so terrell would walk out he'd be holding his cleats in his hand and he had basketball shoes on and i'm like what are you doing he's like "Mm, i'm warming up i'm like yeah but when are you gonna put your cleats on he's like once we go one-on-ones so we would do warm-ups we would do like uh uh, individual drills. So the quarterbacks are over doing our drills. The receivers are doing like cut drills, uh, ladder drills, running uh, routes with the receiver coach, doing sideline stuff. And he's got his basketball shoes on. And I'm like, and he's like chopping his feet. And so he's not slipping and he's really working on it. And then once we decided to go one on ones with the DBs and do competitive stuff, then he would put his cleats on. And when he did that, all of a sudden it looked like a racehorse because dirt was flying up everywhere. <laughs> and he literally, he would mm. go through that first part of practice in basketball shoes. So it made him focus on really cutting his feet and chopping his steps so he wouldn't slip. Yeah. So then when he put his cleats on, it was just so much stronger. And he was just, he was just such a hard That's worker. Cool. And I'll tell you the other thing, the reason why he was such a hard worker was he was on the Niners behind Jerry Rice and Jerry Rice groomed him and taught Mm. him how to practice Mm. and how to work. And everyone known was not, it was every, it was known that Jerry Rice was like, he was one of the hardest working guys and Terrell, Terrell learned from him. And so he was, when it came to practice, he was all business and he was, he was a, to me, he was a good teammate. He was extremely loyal teammate. And and as long as you didn't say anything bad about him, there was no issues. But I, that year that, you know, Donovan said, you know, T.O. was trying to get that new contract. And Donovan said, hey, you know, I think he needs to play out his contract. Well, th- you know, as a quarterback, especially, you know, you got to be careful about that, especially speaking with the media, because the correct answer is, listen, I want all my teammates to get paid as much as they can. 
And, you know, I don't want to get involved in contract talks. We miss yeah. him. We want him back. Yeah. And we're going to work hard. But whenever he comes back, we expect him to be ready. You know, that, yeah. but what happened was Donovan kind yeah. of came out and said, you know, and that's fine. He wants to say, listen, you have a contract. You got to play that contract. Well, the next thing was Westbrook won a new contract about three weeks later. And <laughs> it, what he should have said was, hey, he's got a contract. Play it out. But what Donovan came out and said was, hey, he's our most valuable player. We need to pay him. And ever since then, mm -hmm. T.O. took that personally. And, and that's kind of where that rift kind of started. And it was an unfortunate situation because, you know, T.O. is a – he is a very – you know, when he cried about Romo and said, that's my quarterback, mm -hmm. that, was, that was very sincere and very legit. He, he will have your back. Mm -hmm. As long as you got him, he will be extremely loyal to you. And, um, and he's a hard worker and, and he's a good person. You know, I, I had the opportunity. I lived in Miami in the off season. He lived in Miami. We would get together and throw on the field or go throw on the beach sometimes. And he never turned kids away. He always signed autographs, always would throw football with kids on the beach. And was a great person off the field. And, and the only other thing I would say about uh, that is the media, a lot of times will play their heroes and villains. And, Donovan yeah. was very politically correct where, you know, he could laugh and joke with the media, even though the media would go after Donovan. Sometimes Donovan played it correctly and, you know, would joke back with them and, you know, mm. play it off and, and still be nice to them. If the media said something bad about T.O., he wrote your name down and kept it in a box. And next time you came <laughs> to ask him a question, he was like, no comment. And so he was just a very... <laughs> <laughs> he took things very personable and, yeah. and, you know, like yeah. Donovan could play that political figure where T.O. is a little bit more like, Hey, if I don't like you, you know, it. if I like you, you know it. So I respect both of those guys mm. and how they do things. It's just T.O. The media didn't really side with the way T.O. did some things sometimes. And, and so they went after him a couple of times. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But oh, it was, nice. it was, a, it was a really good learning experience just for me, because I never knew that. And then you see that inside the locker room and you see how things develop and you try not to get involved and you really try to, you know, stay to yourself and stay out of it. But you can see how the media can twist and turn things. And you, you know, what's going on. Yeah. You're in the meetings, you're in the locker room. And uh, a lot of times the media was, couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They're trying to get headlines. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Mando, do you have any more questions for uh, Mike? Well, that, like, literally, he just answered my next question on TO. But um, what was that? Like, you played a. Oh, I was going to ask, like, about the TO, like, McNabb feud and everything. Mm -hmm. Just how it all, like, escalated. Yeah. So you just literally answered that. For yeah. Me. That's, and that's basically how it started. But. And then it kind of it, it they kind of buried the hatchet at the start of the season, and then it kind of came back up, and um, and it was just it was just poorly held by I think both players, and I think impartially the organization as well. I think we they could have mm -hmm. stepped in and, and kept the interviews to a minimum, as opposed to allowing people to do an interview when there's a little bit of a rift going on, and you know, and To ended up saying something that. Uh, he couldn't take back and it was just it was just an unfortunate situation but both were yeah. great players yeah. and when they were on the same page man it was a thing of beauty hmm. yes yeah. so about your time in canada like how is that in the canadian football league well again i think i i think the canadian football league has completely changed uh, i think things hmm. are different now i just know when i was there i it was a little bit uh, of a different thing and i was like man this is not what I signed up for. This is, it felt a little bit more like intramural football and you were only allowed to be on the field practicing for three hours. And that's like meetings, practice, lift, watching film. And then you had to be out. That was just the rules. And, and, you know, you'd go to the field and they'd be playing kickball and it was just, it was just a different, it wasn't as serious. The field was bigger. Um, and that, that, that was a different thing in general. You had to learn the rules. You got, uh, receivers, you got like four receivers in motion at once, and um, and now the defense is moving too. It's, it's one thing when you're playing football and you have one guy going in motion, you kind of see the defense run. Okay, it's man, it's zone. You kind of read the coverage. 
But when you have like multiple guys running around and then the defense starts moving around, like what am I supposed to read here? You know? And so it's just a different game. <laughs> and uh, also the NFL, you, you charter planes, so you, you know, you go hop on the plane, fly there, stay there the night before the game, get up, go play the game. And then as soon as the game's over, you shower change, head straight to the airport, right to the jetway, and you're on the plane and you fly home. And you could get home at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. You can get home at, you know, 2 in the morning, depending on where your flight was and where you, what time you played. Well, in Canada, we had a fly commercial. So after the game, there was no flight. So you had to go stay in the hotel. And it was a little bit like how hockey and, and baseball like guys go out on the town in the other cities i never went out on the town in the other city so you would go out and then you had to get up and catch your early flight the next day and you're walking on the plane with a, a bunch of uh you know civilians too so it's just, it was just a different thing and and i was like yeah i don't know about this uh so it, it was just different but i think it's changed and i think it's definitely gotten more serious i think the the uh the practice thing and i think things are i mean our practice field was at a university and we our our locker room was in a trailer it was like a portable trailer so it was just different it was just uh you know you guys didn't stay to watch film extra the way they do in the nfl and uh they just i just feel like it wasn't taken as seriously like it was it was for lack of a better term, at the time somewhat subpar compared to the professionalism of the nfl you would say very much so, yeah. And then I ended up going on to that UFL, and that was a great league. It's just, unfortunately, they were trying to compete with the NFL during the lockout. That was the main thing. They thought yeah. the NFL was going to do the lockout. Yeah. And we had some great coaches, a lot of former NFL coaches, a lot of former NFL players, and uh, and just, unfortunately, not not the funds uh, and, and things didn't go the way they wanted to go. Yeah. No, that's fair. Manjo, any more questions? Uh, just one final one, like, like just discuss like Andy Reid, like Marty Monaway, like all these coaches, like how is it like to play under them? Um, a, a lot of, it's very, uh, very good offensive minded coaches. Um, uh, Marty, Marty was one of the best offensive minds, you know, I got a chance to play with. He, he actually was a quarterback under in high school, and his coach was uh, uh, Mike Holmgren. And then Mike Holmgren eventually, you know, moves up and starts coaching. Marty uh, was a quality control guy in Green Bay. Eventually, coached the quarterbacks in Green Bay. He coached with Favre, and then Marty went on to San Francisco and coached with Mariucci. Uh, and then we had Mariucci come into Detroit. You know, Marty was a great offensive-minded coach, though, and I think he didn't get a fair chance in Detroit. You know, they, I think when the, Detroit was trying to hire that head coach, they wanted Mariucci. They couldn't get a deal done. So they ended up getting Marty. And then two years later, the Niners ended up firing uh, Mariucci. And then immediately the Lions went after uh, Mariucci. And both were good coaches. Mariucci was another good offensive coach. He was a fun guy. But one thing I really liked about uh, – Steve Mariucci was, he was a, a player's coach, a family coach. You could have, you know, you had fun, but you know, a lot of times coaches would be in the building till 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Some guys would sleep overnight. And I remember very vividly at times, Mariucci came in one time to the quarterback room and said, all right, get out of here. Go quarterbacks, go home. And the coach was like, well, no, I got to go. He goes, nope, they're going home. And he goes, you pack your stuff up and go home too. Go see your wife, go see your kids. And, and so, it, you know, Mariucci didn't want, you know, he wanted family. He wanted, you know, you had to have, you had to have a balance. So he was good mm. in that aspect. Um, Coach Reed, um, uh, he, I was a little intimidated by him, you know, because he was the head coach. He would call the plays. We met with him. He was, he was a little bit of a jokester, but it was like he would tell the joke and it wouldn't like – he'd have like a little smile on his face, but it wasn't like, you're like, is he serious? Is he joking? You know? So, and I never really knew him that well. So Donovan and Andy had a great relationship. They could really get along well, but, um, but, um, but yeah, like, I think like I was just as a backup, I was like, I, I you know, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I'm, I, they just yeah. came off the Super Bowl. I'm just, just tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. And let me just absorb everything right now. And then, uh, 
So, yeah, but Andy was a great coach. Players loved him. Uh, they, all these coaches had um, a senior – uh, a senior council, I would say, you know, where they guys that have been around the legs, the, the older, the veterans, the tenure guys, the leaders of the team. And, you know, it was, it was about like, you know, you know, eight to 10, maybe eight guys, seven guys. And they would, uh, he would call a meeting and those guys would kind of go in and be like, Hey coach, you're really working us hard. The guys are starting to feel it, you know, and they would listen to that and be like, all right, well, we'll do this. We'll do that. We'll take this day off we'll give you guys a break. And so they, you know, say they were very good in listening to their players and trying to get as much input from their players, but also at the same time pushing you. Yeah. So I've been, I was fortunate to have played Mm -hmm. for guys like that. Um, And then when I was in Virginia, uh, Marty shot, you know, and all those guys were great coaches. Marty Schottenheimer uh, was our coach in Virginia Mm -hmm. for the Virginia destroyers. And, and Mm -hmm. by far to me, I was always intimidated by Marty Schottenheimer. You know, you always you see NFL films and he's always yelling and screaming. And I was like, man, this guy's mean. But he, uh, yeah, he was a great motivator. He could push you and work you hard, but he would listen. And he was in it. He was one of the most emotional coaches I've ever met. And when I say emotional, like every pregame, he, he would tell speeches and he was so into it. He would get choked up and he would almost, he would come to tears. Wow. And he was just, he was wow. such a great coach. Oh. And we were getting ready to play for the championship game in the UFL in the Virginia. And it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, it was, you know, the UFL, but he's playing in the championship game. And sure enough, one of his former players shows up to, and it's Bill Cower. You know, Bill Cower just retired from the Steelers and he shows up to support his old coach, Marty Schottenheimer, because Cower played for Schottenheimer and, and learned from him. So, it just goes to wow. show you how great of a person he was and uh, and how and how wow. good of a coach he was. I, I really learned a lot from him and I respect him so much. Wow. That's cool. That's amazing. Um, and I'll, I'll just finish out the interview with a few fun questions. Um, but before I do, I'll ask, um, so you retired in 2012. What have you been doing with yourself, you know, career-wise, life-wise since that time? Well, uh, from the time between uh, the Canadian League and then the UFL, so uh, 2007 was the Canadian League. So 2006, when I got released, I kind of had to stay in shape and work out um, just in case someone got hurt. And well, at the time, I would still I started playing golf down in Miami. And then uh, 2007, I went to the Canadian League. And, you know, you had a lot of downtime. So I played some golf up there and Mm-hmm. 2008 there was no football so I played and I ended up running in and playing to uh, I play golf every day almost with Lawrence Taylor uh, he I used to just play a little bit here and there and then one day a guy introduced me to LT and you know LT took an immediate liking to me because I was a former uh, NFL player and I was extremely competitive mm. and so was LT so we would go and we would have competitive golf matches and I'd play with him um and it, it, it was funny because he would be like, we had some really close matches. And then it got to the point where I was like, listen, this guy's going to start playing me for money. I better start practicing. So <laughs> I, uh, I started practicing and I, I started beating him quite a bit. And, and he'd be like, I need to take a break, you know? And then sure Isn't enough, he much money. Take a, well, he, he, no, no, he, no, he was not, not at all. He was like, I, I just need to take a break. <laughs> and, and so the, he's like, I'm like, LT, are you sure you don't want to play tomorrow? I'm like, eh. and he's like, no, no. And then sure enough, we'd have a foursome set up. And I, I, this is a true story. I'm laying in bed and my phone is ringing and I'm a heavy sleeper and I rarely wake up yeah. and my, it's ringing and ringing. And I'm like, I finally wake up and it, I've had like five missed calls and I finally answer the phone. And it was like, <laughs> are you going to sleep all damn day or what? And I was like, LT, it is 3.50 in the morning. It's literally 3.50. And he's like, well, shoot. He's like, are you playing today? And I was like, yeah. He's like, what time? And I was like, 7.30. And he's like, where at? I'm like, LT, we already have four. And he'd be like, where at? And I'm like, well, at this course. He's like, oh, they'll let you run five. I'll see you there. And sure enough, you would show up at the golf course, and he would already be sweating, lathered up on the range. I mean, it was so funny. Uh, you couldn't, he couldn't stay away, but, um, 
So actually, it was funny because I, I played a lot of golf with him. He ended up bringing me into his game with. Uh, it was the only time in my life I was starstruck. Yep. He brought me in his game with Michael Jordan. They were college oh, roommates. Oh, wow. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and, wow. And, and I see him on the range. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is Michael. This is Michael Jordan, you know. And yeah. I, I, I stayed. I stay away. I'm like, I don't want to say anything. I don't know what to do. So I'm on. LT comes over. And he's like, all right, go to the first tee. So I go to the first tee and all of a sudden Michael Jordan comes walking over. He puts his hand out and goes, hi, I'm Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow. I want to be like, yeah, no shit. You know, but I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put my hand out, you know, and he introduced me with his first and last name. So I thought it was only proper to do myself. So I'm like, oh, hi, I'm Mike McMahon. And as soon as I do that, LT goes, man, he don't want to know your last name. Just hit the damn ball. <laughs> uh, it was so funny. But um, another guy that was just a, a, a pure class guy that no matter, you know, the biggest athlete in the world, and he was nothing but nice to me, nothing but a great experience. Played a lot of golf with them. Uh, and then I went back and played in the UFL. After the UFL, I had a, a chance to – I wanted to go into coaching – um, and, uh, after the UFL, actually it was, uh, the, I never thought about coaching. And then the UFL coaches were like, Hey, we think you'd be good at it. You really help out the younger guys. So I, there was an opportunity mm. for me to go coach, uh, and promote American football in Sweden. And oh, wow. I did. And once <laughs> I went over there, they were like, well, you know, you, you can play too. We're allowed to have one offensive guy. Uh, and one defensive guy. So I ended up playing and ended up like, hurting my knee. So that came back. Uh, I coached for two years. I coached one year at Division One Double A. I coached another year uh, at high school. Mm-hmm. I had an opportunity to coach at West Virginia, but I, I, I was getting ready to head down for the interview, and they called me, and they asked me when I graduated Rutgers. And at the time, I technically I didn't, and they said, you know, that's going to be an issue, you know, to coach at the D1 level. They want all their coaches to have their degrees. Yep. So I ended up going back to Rutgers get, to get my degree, uh, which the requirements were originally one semester. They had changed that to go for a full year. Uh, and this time I actually uh, straight A's and made Dean's List. So oh, wow. it just meant a little bit more. You know, the NFL nice. would pay for it as long as nice. you had a, a, a decent GPA. And I, yep. I, I worked my butt off to get straight A's. And uh, that's awesome. So I did that. And then um, I actually attended this. <laughs> I still wanted to do the coaching, but I attended this NFL broadcasting boot camp yep. uh, just to see what that was like and, you know, uh, kind of get me out of my comfort zone. Uh, my two biggest fears in life number one is snakes. If you see it, I will never be near it. <laughs> and number two was uh, public speaking. And I was like, yep. all right, well, if the only way you're going to grow is by getting out there and, and stepping out of your comfort zone. So I did some Keller commentary and, uh, and some game analyzing the past three years, uh, some small colleges on ESPN three. And then also I did some high school football on Friday nights. And uh, so I just have been doing the broadcasting the past three years. Awesome. Thought about doing a podcast. Yeah. Wasn't sure if I really want to go there a little bit more of a, in, uh, a behind the scenes tell all type thing, but I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'd rather, mm, yeah, I'd yeah. rather get into coaching and, yeah. uh, and help. Cause I honestly feel when I look back at my career, especially with Ty Detmer and how much I learned from him and how much, mm. you know, I, you know, I learned so much from Ty and not so much from my, my actual position coach at that level. Mm. And I just thought there was a big, there was a big empty area that teams are missing on. This is the guy that you is, you know, so many teams say this is the most important position in all of sport. I actually think it's the O-line and the D-line really. But if you're mm. going to draft a quarterback that mm. high and invest all that money, I think you would want a guy that's a, a, a coach that knows that position inside and out. Maybe a guy that's been on the field and been in that position before. Yep. And these guys are young guys and they're still developing. And I think a lot of times, especially you look at a guy like Joey, he never was able, had a chance to fully develop. And I think a lot of mm. quarterbacks, you, they come in the league and then they're out and they're these number one draft picks and they're just not given the right opportunity, whether it be the right coaching. And I think, I think you can really help out. Uh, I think that quarterback coach is actually a much more valuable position 
coach than people realize. Mm. And it's not just, you know, hire a buddy and relay information. I think you really need a guy that can help those guys deal with the, the locker room, deal with the, the playbook, deal with the media, deal yeah. with the on the field and off field. Cause you basically are the face of the franchise and you have to be able to handle that properly. And I've seen a lot. And if you're not doing that correctly, you're going to have, you're going to have struggles. And I've seen a lot of great quarterbacks and great athletes not win because of that. And a perfect example to me is if you look at mm. Tom Brady. He wasn't the most mm. athletic guy, mm. but the one thing Tom Brady was able to do was he was able to lift up his teammates and play higher than what their ability was. Tom Brady, you got a locker room of guys from all different walks of life. You know, one guy grew up in this house. One guy grew up in a divorced family. One guy grew up with his parents together. Inner city, out of city, kids growing up in bad neighborhoods, good neighborhoods. And as a quarterback, you have to make sure that all these guys gel, come together and gel. And you have to be sensitive to certain upbringings and certain things. And so you have to understand how to pull that out of people. And I think Brady is one of the great motivators. You know, perfect example is you look at what he did with Antonio Brown and, and, mm. you know, Antonio said, you know, Ben Roethlisberger never invited him to his house in all the years he was in Pittsburgh. Well, Brady invited him mm. into his home after all that stuff, after all the yeah. instant off the field incidents, he brings him in and, helps him and then even after the fact you saw Antonio come out, come out kind of come out recently this past season and kind of Bama and Brady still took the high road and said listen I love Antonio Brown I want the best for him you have to be able to do that yeah. whether whether yeah. you yeah. mean it or not you have to be able to really like you ha it's got to feel genuine because if it's not these guys won't play for you and I think that's one of the great things that Brady was able to do is to bring these guys in a locker room together absolutely I absolutely agree yeah. with that. And that's honestly an amazing um, – I think that's a perfect way to end the episode, I think. Um, you know, we went full mm -hmm. circle. We started with, you know, um, high school and we ended it with um, Tom Brady and, you know, where you <laughs> ended your career as well. Um, so I, I think that wraps it up quite well. Um, I'll just pass it off to Brad and Manjot if they have any final questions or things they want to say to you, Mike. We'll, we'll start that off with Brad. Yeah, first off, again, thanks for taking your time. I mean, we really appreciate you, mm -hmm. you doing this and helping us promote the game. Um, so the big thing, the big deal nowadays is, you know, uh, quarterbacks getting their line gifts and all that. Was that, I'm just curious, was that a big deal when you guys, did you have to feel obligated to get your O lineman gifts and all that? Yeah, you did. And it was, it's all relative of what your contract is. I mean, you can't. You can't go out yeah, and get some fancy yeah, gift right. if you can't, you know, if you're not making that money. Um, yeah. You have to, you have to, you should go yeah. out. You know, we, I would take the guys out to dinner to like a nice dinner. Um, um, yeah. and it, but I think it, it just goes to show you like I, one thing Marty did for me, um, Marty Morningwig was, hey, he's like, listen, you got to take care of the right people mm. in the organization as well. So at Christmas time, I would always give money, a card and money to the equipment guys, to the security guys, to the people up in the office. Thank nice. you for, you know, putting up with us. Thank you for putting up with the team. You know, nothing much, you know, you give a hundred dollars to everyone, just yeah. boom, boom. And, and I know it's, you know, it adds up, but it goes a long way. And, and those people Absolutely. work yeah. their butts off and they don't make, and I think Marty really taught me, Hey, you got to take care of the little people. Obviously, you take care of your linemen. You take care of your receivers. Um, you know, I, I know guys that play with Brady, and anytime Brady were to throw a ball up, and if it was going to get intercepted, and if the receiver broke it up or even got offensive pass interference and broke it up, Tom Brady paid him $100 just for breaking up the interception. So you take, you know, nice. when guys know that, hey, you know, I'm going to give that little extra, you know, a little bit here and there. I know Desmond Howard. Anytime he returned a kickoff for a touchdown, everyone on the team got a hundred dollars. It was, you know, little stuff like that. So now all those guys, you know, Desmond Howard's back there returning a punt or a kickoff and you got the entire team like, Hey, let's put a little extra into it. Cause like every time Desmond would double it, if he did another one and then if he did another one, so they were all fighting extra hard 
to help spring those blocks. And I think it goes a long way, that little extra big, hey, man, this guy is going to take care of us if we take care of him. So I, I think there's a lot of that. That's, it, there, yeah. it definitely goes That's on, cool. though. And, and you got to do it all within what your budget is, though. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then uh, I got to know, did you beat Jordan in the golf game? I, you know, <laughs> I did. And it was funny because ah. he <laughs> – he uh, he came and he's like, what do you what are you uh, comfortable playing with? And I was like, uh, you know, he's like, is a hundred dollars, you know, like two down press, okay? And I was like, oh okay. So we're playing and I have an individual with, match with him. So a hundred dollars front back total, and then if you fall down two, anytime anyone goes down two, it's an automatic press. So I'm playing that, but then I have a team game and Jordan's his guy and I got LT and me and LT are a team versus Jordan and his guy. And the team bet, and we play 36 holes, by the way, it's not 18. It was 36 tee off at 10 AM play 36 holes. Everyone has their own cart. I mean, wow. we literally would get 36 in in five and a half, six hours. Yep. And wow. so Jordan and the team kept on pressing and I'm like, wait a second, you know, my individual, but I, the team game, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. And he just kept on pressing and pressing <laughs> And I remember the, the very first time we played the last hole, I was like, he pressed the last three holes and we kept on winning. And it came to the last hole. I'm like, if he won, he double pressed the last hole. And if he won, I was going to have to pay like 15 grand. And I didn't have that money on me. <laughs> I was like, oh. So I, the LT and I both made birdie. And I was so happy because we ended up walking away. And then, uh, and so then Jordan goes, all right, same time tomorrow. And I'm like, uh, he's like, Mikey, you in? And I was like, um, yeah, if you want me, he's like, yeah. He's like, shit, you got my money. You're in now. So I was, I was very lucky. You know, it was about a, a time in my life where he was building his home in the bears club. Um, he has, he was dating, uh, Yvonne who he's married to now. Uh, she lived in Miami. So he would fly in, he would stay there for a week. And he would check on his home in the morning and then he'd come down, we'd play golf and uh, 36 for seven straight days. And, and it would probably be about once wow. a month for about two or three years straight. And uh, so it, wow. it, he, he opened up, I learned a lot from him just about who he is as a person, you know, certain things about his personal mm -hmm. life, really great guy. Um, but was he uh, as competitive yeah, he, on the golf course as he was extremely, in basketball? Ex yeah. It, yeah. So <laughs> So, you know, at one point he said I should give him strokes and, <laughs> and, and, he, and he said, and, and so he said, uh, he's like, don't, don't you believe you should be giving me strokes? And I said, he's like, what do you, what do you think my handicap is? And I was like, ah, Mike, I've seen you, I've seen him shoot 65 and I've seen him shoot 85. Mm -hmm. And I said to him the one day, I said, you know, I would say you're probably about a a three or a four, you know, and he's like, yeah, and you're scratch. And I said, yeah, he goes, so you should give me at least, you know, two aside. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but he goes, well, he's, I'm a fair guy. Why aren't you being fair with me? And I said, well, I am like, <laughs> if you want to be, the so th this is what I said to him. I go, if you really want to be fair, like, you know, you say you like to press and get me out of my comfort zone. And he's like, yeah. And I said, okay, well, the only way to be fair is for me to be able to do it back to you. And he said, kid, you don't have enough money to get me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> and I said, you're right. You're right. You do. You're, I said, you're hundred percent right. But Michael, I said, I thought about this. Let's do what I'm betting to my net worth, yep. the ratio to your net worth. So yes. for every thousand dollars I yeah. pay, yeah. You have to pay a hundred thousand. I go, yep. Mike, I will give you a stroke, a hole for a thousand to a hundred thousand. I go, yep. will that get you out of your comfort zone? And he started laughing. He goes, you know what? I thought about something. He goes, I thought about that. He goes, but I, we'll just keep it as is. And I was like, okay, we'll, we'll keep it. There then. <laughs> so oh. it was, uh, it was, a, it was a lot of good memories though. That's perfect. Um, Manjot, any last questions for all, all things you want to say to Mike? So Michael Jordan was just trying to be like Mike, you know, <laughs> he, he was awesome. Right there. He was awesome. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, one more quick story. He, 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 he had a buddy that always came and played with him and we were pretty even mm -hmm. and it got to the point where, you know, I started practicing and we were pretty even. And then I just started beating him this one week. And so, he was complaining and he wanted me to give him strokes. 
So after we played, he's like, this isn't fair. Mike, Mike should be giving me strokes. To, and he's complaining to Michael Jordan. And Michael's kind of like the, the judge, the jury, you know, whatever he yeah. says goes. And yeah. he's trying to plead his case to Michael. <laughs> and he turns. Um, so Michael turns to me. He's like, Mikey, what'd you do last night? And I was like, what? He goes, what'd you do last night after golf? I'm like, well, I, I went home. I picked up some food on the way home. And I took a shower and I went to bed. He goes, what time did you go to bed? I go, seriously? He's like, yeah. I'm like, I was in bed at seven. And he started laughing. He goes, what time did you get up? And I was like, I was up at four. And he goes, what'd you do? I go, I ran the beach, came back, uh, got a little workout in, did some stretching, went to the sauna, showered, came to the course. And I've been at the course since 830 and we tee off at 10. So I was like, you know, warmed up. He goes, he goes, Darren, what'd you do last night? And Darren goes, well, I went to the club. He goes, yep. what time did you go to bed? He goes, well, I got back at, uh, I got back. I was with this girl and I finally got back at five in the morning. And yeah. he goes, and he goes, and what time did you, uh, what time did you wake up? He's like, well, I woke up at eight and then, and then came over. And he goes, see, he goes, I get Darren, <laughs> and Jordan goes, see, you ain't dedicating yourself to the game. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and everyone started <laughs> laughing. He goes, you got to dedicate yourself to the game. He goes, I went out with my, he goes, I went out with my fiance last night. We had dinner. And I went home and I said, listen, I'm going home. I'm going to bed. He goes, I got up. I did yoga with her. I was, I'm dedicating myself. Darren, you can't just be partying and all expect people to hand stuff to you. No, <laughs> Mike's not giving you strokes. So he is extremely competitive. And if you put it. that work in, he, he was, he was good it. about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's wicked. That's awesome. Uh, Manjot, anything else, Mike? Uh, I just want to say thank you to Mike. You know, it's been a great interview. Um, thanks for all oh, your stories, no you know, from like Detroit, like from like way back in high Everything. school until like Michael Jordan, like Tom Brady style, like talk. That's so amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, yep. Mike. I've... No problem. 